Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here. I was at this conference 10 years ago, and uh, it's nice to be back, and you've picked a great topic. Um, I'm going to focus on three things in my remarks, all of them really to do with policy. I'm going to talk about the economic impact, which I think is important for how competition authorities and regulators should approach peer-to-peer um, -peer markets. I'm then going to go on and talk about regulation, by which I mean what regulators as opposed to antitrust authorities do. And then I'm going to talk about antitrust and the antitrust implications of um, uh, some of these markets. But I think uh, Jonathan's remarks fit very well with what I'm talking about because he's nicely shown um, that there are um, several separate streams of economic research that could come out of this area. It's quite a potentially busy field. Let me start with talking about impact, and um, John has covered this uh, to, to, some, to, to a large extent, but um, a lot of these peer-to-peer -peer markets come from reducing transactions costs, and we know from Coase from Williamson um, that actually a lot of conventional economic structures come from um, transactions costs. And when you begin to remove transactions costs, you, um, you deal with better matching, you deal with um, the market for lemons, you, you control for asymmetric information in some instances. You can reduce the cost of people entering the market, so you can move a market, um, a taxi market, from being organized as a single firm with lots of employees to a decentralized platform with, with flexible supply. Um, and so all of these are really important. And if you look at, for example, some of the examples of what Airbnb and Uber have done. So for example, Uber has a very nice chart showing that in New York City at four in the afternoon when the shift changes, Uber's workers um, peak. Um, so they go up um, as the New York yellow cabs go down at four in the afternoon. <clears throat> and if you see the effect of Airbnb and similar platforms during the London Olympics or other high profile events, you see very nice examples of the type of effect of um, dealing with peak loading problems. And we know in a lot of these markets, whether it's hotels, I mean, I can't think how many complaints I had to deal with in government on hotels charging excessive prices um, uh, at certain times of the year uh, and consumers not understanding um, peak load pricing. So you get a lot of economic benefits, whether it's better matching, whether it's asymmetric information, whether it's um, supply side and increasing capacity, um, changing the boundaries of the firm. <clears throat> but you also have some business stealing, um, and that's particularly pre prevalent, but not only confined to cases where there are restrictions in place to protect existing players. So for example, taxi drivers in most countries, happily I can say not in Ireland where I played a large part in liberalizing the market. Um, in most countries, the number of taxis is restricted either by a physical number or, as in London, by a very costly test called a knowledge. Um, and then the question is, what, what sort of business dealing effects do we see in these markets and how much of them are coming from genuine efficiency, how much of them are coming from regulatory uh, bypassing existing regulation, and how much of them are actually business dealing because people are, are shortchanging on, on regulation. Um, there's a nice paper by uh, Zervis and Byers looking at Airbnb in, in, in Austin, which is I think the busiest city, and showing about an 8 to 10% reduction in traditional hotel bookings in that, si that city. Now the problem is that even if you have a 90% market expansion from one of these technologies, but you have a 10% um, reduction in demand for the existing um, technology, that technology is going to go to regulators. Um, and and lobby for change, and I'll come back to that. So you could, but you can have a bad situation in which you have a big positive economic effect for consumers, and at the same time a small negative effect on incumbents can, can dominate that. There is a question um, as to what the scope across the economy of these changes are. So even if we accept in taxi markets, in accommodation markets, that there are big efficiency effects um, and big positive impacts for consumers, there's a question about how wide that will go across the economy. Um, it's difficult to see it, um, the breakdown of transactions costs heading into motor manufacturing. Other things are going to do that, maybe. Um, but for example, a lot of the services we consume in the economy um, may face disruption in this area, or they may not. So think about care for the elderly. Can that be fragmented and supplied in this type of flexible peer-to-peer -peer type way or not? And I, I think we see some rich um, examples of that. So let me turn to regulation, because I think this is absolutely going to be critical. And John 
quoted Stigler on taxis, and that was a huge understatement, I thought. Um, the, the regulation of these markets is going to be absolutely critical. And peer-to-peer -peer can undermine regulation um, in, in a number of different ways. First, regulation that protects incumbents. So um, Uber gets around these quantitative restrictions on entry. Airbnb gets around planning restrictions on hotels. Um, and I would probably distinguish in planning restrictions and zoning restrictions, but in, in some countries it's, it's just impossible to build new hotels easily. But actually bringing apartments into the, that, that market as supply. This explains why some of these business models like Uber and Airbnb bring bigger benefits in countries like Italy um, than they do maybe in countries like America where, or for example, Uber has no presence in Dublin because the, market, the taxi market was liberalized um, 15 years ago. Um, as Jonathan points out, they protect classes of citizens and you can see, I think, in the case of, for example, Uber and Airbnb, um, an emerging market, emerging argument about labor um, and labor protection. Because I, I, I don't see the taxi drivers yet running this argument or the hotels running this argument because they're, they're at the first level of attack. But they're quickly going to work out that the best argument is that we're going to replace employed people employed by large corporations with job security and tenure with a cadre of part-time workers who don't have job security and we're going to undermine social cohesion. And these social cohesion arguments, I would argue, rather than the consumer protection arguments, are going to be the most difficult ones. So this issue Uber's facing in, in San Francisco, while I'm sure that they'll overcome it on a narrow legal issue, actually with a lot of regulation, um, startups are good at dodging the initial regulation what they're very bad at doing is anticipating how the incumbents will have the market re-regulated to deal with their business model. And you see that in, in, in lots of um, instances where, uh, particularly in financial services, where um, disruptive innovators um, get around the current regulation but don't um, future-proof their business model against changes to regulation that get introduced against them. And I would say that labor law one is one. Another example of that social cohesion one is um, uh, disabled access in taxis. So, for example, in the UK and in London in particular, every taxi must be wheelchair accessible. Um, if Uber puts black cabs out of business, um, you're going to have a big issue about social cohesion there. The third issue with regulation um, is around market failure and things like quality standards, um, insurance requirements. Um, uh, Kate talked about that. So, for example, black cabs in London have to have 50 pounds, 50,000 pounds insurance all the time. Uber has 1 million insurance for just when they, from when the car is called to when it drops off the passenger. Our regulator is going to be flexible enough to um, allow both those types of insurance models in the market. Or are they going to stick with a model that says if a black cab is, is insured 100% of the time, then so should the Uber car. And if you're trying to get flexible supply, so somebody who drives their kids to school then goes and drives somebody else for money and then goes back and collects their kids to bring them back from school, um, are, you, are you going to want to allow that type of flexible supply in the market or not? And, and things like insurance um, will matter and they'll, be, they'll get argued on quality standards. Interestingly, in the last 24 hours, there's been a story in London that the mayor of London is going to require all Uber drivers to pass the knowledge test. Um, that would be a classic example of protecting competitors, not consumers, because of all the complaints you hear about consumer protection in, in ta with Uber in London, I've never heard anybody other than taxi drivers, their competitors, complaining about um, sat-nav not being a reasonable way of getting around town. But as Kate said, peer-to-peer -peer can also obviate the need for some regulation. Jonathan dealt with this as well. So I'm going to deal with um, uh, three issues here. The first is... Um, uh, review systems, and Kate's dealt a lot with this, and I'll just make some points. The first is just we need to be worried about coverage, and both um, people who haven't used the service making reviews, and then people who have used the service not making reviews. So there are biases on both sides, and they raise different issues, and there's probably some very nice econometric work to be done on understanding what the sample selection biases mean in terms of, of, of those. The second point is on um, Assuming we're in closed systems, so only people who've used the service can make a review, um, you have the question of observable versus unobservable characteristics. So if I buy something on eBay or sell something on eBay, I can observe pretty well, perfectly, um, whether the good has arrived, whether it is what it was described as, 
reasonable people might quibble, but it's pretty observable. If I get into an Uber car, I can observe whether there's a crack in the chassis of the car, whether the driver is drunk, um, lots of other aspects of quality, whether they're, the way they're driving is risky. I can't observe whether they've had three accidents in the last week or whether they're an incredibly safe driver. And so um, not all of the characteristics are observable. So Uber gives a big quality improvement to customers. Uh, Uber drivers are polite, which is not what you would say about black cab drivers in London. Um, and they do their best to please you and so forth. But um, you also then have a problem of collusion. I've twice recently got out of an Uber car where they've said to me, let's both each rate each other five. So you have to worry about that. And then, of course, it doesn't work for a lot of financial services because there you can't. You may be able to observe the outcome, but not for many years. If you're thinking savings, other products, and so in those markets, um, ratings actually don't work because the length of time is too long for people to, to get in. There's a really interesting emerging literature on online reputation, the ability of the consumer to own their reputation across several markets and use that. Um, there's some nice examples of people who've moved from, say, for example, Australia to New York, who've managed to use eBay, Airbnb, and Uber recommendations to basically get a landlord as a substitute for a reference to get a landlord to give them an apartment. So people are beginning to use online reputation. Um, we'll come back to that. The second um, aspect of, of how these models can help with regulation, um, so I've dealt with ratings, is the brand incentive. Jonathan talked about this. I would just say that we already have some examples of that. So, for example, in, in supermarket retailing, if you compare the inspection regime on supermarkets with small independently owned grocers, there is very little difference in the regulatory standard that's applied to them, even though supermarkets, being big, have a very strong brand reputation in protecting. Now, in the UK, there was a big movement to try and have risk-based inspection programs. So you have the same standard, but actually you inspect them less because you rely more on their self-inspection. Um, this was on the consumer protection, sort of health and safety type um, arguments, food safety arguments. And in actual fact, that they've never really got that far with that. I mean, they rely a little bit more on the internal systems in larger companies. But I would say that the hope that companies like Uber uh, manage to have uh, a, a regulatory holiday because they're big and have a brand to protect is probably not going to, to help. The third area is how regulators can use data creatively to solve some of these problems. So let me go back to the um, wheelchair accessibility problem. A regulator could ask Uber, A, to have a wheelchair accessible vehicle option on its app, and it presumably could do that. It could then charge differential fees, um, either to Uber or to the drivers, for having a wheelchair accessible vehicle. It could then, thirdly, measure the waiting times, and it could vary that fee until it had sufficient entry of accessible vehicles that it had the same waiting time um, for uh, um, accessible users uh, demanding taxis. I don't see in a lot of our taxi regulators the wit to think about using data in those ways, but it's really important that competition authorities and others advocate those sort of solutions of using, um, using these data for um, regulation. Ultimately, we need to be trying to regulate for consumer outcomes, not for regulatory inputs, but most regulators focus on, on regulatory inputs. Um, I'll just mention one thing that, uh, two things that are happening in the UK that are very relevant to this. One is in financial services, and there is a peer-to-peer -peer movement in financial services, where the Financial Conduct Authority, very much at my urging, has set up something called an innovation hub. And anybody who's got an innovative business model who wants to get into the financial services can go to the innovation hub in the regulator, and they can help argue their case through the approval system. Um, in some areas, they have actually given temporary licenses to people pending their full authorization, although that's been with legacy businesses in transition but they are thinking about whether that's appropriate for new entrants. And secondly, the Cabinet Office in the UK, number 10, as part of the better regulation movement, has a regulatory challenge um, uh, thing where if somebody has a disruptive business model outside of financial services, they can go there and then the Prime Minister's Office will champion them with the regulator. So, for example, Airbnb and One Fine Stay succeeded in having the national law in Britain changed last year to allow three-month short-term lettings Whereas up until now, Airbnb and One Fine Stay have been operating um, more or less illegally, um, uh, just depending on enforcement priorities of local authorities. The local authorities vigorously opposed that change in regulation. They did not want to lose control, and the relevant minister opposed it as well. Um, 
but the, the government pushed it through because the Prime Minister's office was persuaded by these disruptive entrants. It wanted to send a signal about the UK being a place where innovation could thrive and siding with innovators um, and new business models rather than with incumbents. Um, but it is there and it's something that other countries could look at and the competition authorities in other countries should think about advocating um, to the regulators. But ultimately a lot of these business models have succeeded not by complying with regulation but by being ubiquitous, um, getting consumers on board and using the leverage of having a mass consumer market and a lot of public support to batter regulators and not to enforcing existing regulation. That's worked in the UK, it's worked less well as you know in France, Belgium, uh, uh, Berlin and other places where Uber's tried to get in. Let me thir um, turn thirdly and quickly to um, antitrust. Um, with antitrust, the, the, there are a number of issues. There's one issue about when a centralized exchange um, becomes a network of anti-competitive agreements. Um, so in London, um, Halo, the, the app that tried to work with black cabs, the traditional market, wanted to put in place um, a minimum fare at certain times of the day, and I think did, but it obviously raised the antitrust risk that it was um, getting all of the existing suppliers to collude to match the sort of surge pricing and to get an increase in supply. Um, when will Uber's surge pricing model um, be looked at as a possible um, price coordination across lots of independent contractors? And of course we know that with all of the work that's been done on MFNs, there are going to be many, many business models in this area that are going to face interesting challenges about how they work their agreements in these peer-to-peer -peer markets. Because competition, they, these peer-to-peer -peer, um, players can't have it both ways. If, they're, if their atomized suppliers are not employees, then they are undertakings. <laughs> and their agreements are going to be agreements between undertakings. So they're either going to get caught under competition law on agreements, potentially, although materiality will be important, or they're going to get caught under labor law. So this is what I mean about needing to anticipate where the, the attack will come from. Secondly is going to be the question about the obligations that a peer-to-peer -peer platform has as it becomes dominant. So for example, is a lack of exclusivity on the supply side going to be a good defense in a two-sided market like taxis? And I would say that's going to be challenging because if you've got all the consumers signed up, giving your drivers a choice of driving with other platforms may not uh, matter in some of those markets. A second question is, um, you can distinguish between um, substantively superior platforms and iteratively superior platforms. And one of the, if a substantively superior platform comes along, it's very likely the network effects that favor the original innovator are going to favor a substantive step up. The problem is antitrust is probably going to focus its attention much more on the iterative ones because they're the ones who are going to come and complain. So you have scenario A, you have somebody who's doing small tweaks to what the incumbent is doing. They're going to go and complain to the competition authority. Competition authorities are all too happy to accept complaints from one big player against another big player where there's little benefit for consumers but a lot of rent to be shared out between the two of them over something that's not that innovative. The second scenario is where somebody is doing something truly innovative comes along. They're not going to bother complaining about the, um, the incumbent um, because they realize that they can do something much better of them. And there's a bias in antitrust that we go after cases with me too type competitors fighting about rent when in actual fact we should be um, not incentivizing people to do that type of iterative innovation, but instead focus on substantive um, um, innovation. Um, a third issue that's going to come up is the question of open data. So there's a whole open data movement that antitrust is sort of blissfully unaware of. Um, but the example where it's coming up in Europe at the moment is on, is on banking. So the second payments directive is going to require the third party um, applications so price comparison websites put in the form of an app on your iPhone, can have API or application program interface um, to your bank account transaction data, thereby enabling a third party to advise you on where you would get a better savings rate, a better loan rate, or a better current account product. These are complicated products. Consumers don't switch. There's an investigation in the UK into more or less into switching and banking and why it doesn't work. Um, this is a technological solution. Previous efforts in energy and other areas in the UK um, as companies like energy companies, uh, airlines, financial services have used technology to engage in more sophisticated and complex pricing to extract rent through price discrimination, um, competition authorities and regulators have responded by urging simplification. But this offers a solution that basically says, no, we equip consumers with technology on the other side of the market 
so as to better allow them to, to meet these um, complex um, pricing models. But there, the default is going to be that the consumer owns their own data. So when will a consumer, when should a consumer own their own um, trading um, record on Uber or on um, uh, eBay? When should a rival platform be able to have access to those data? And that question is unresolved, and it's unclear how antitrust is going to deal with it, um, but it's a really important, um, a really important um, public policy question. The final point I'd just like to make is I think antitrust has also to be careful about the ecosystem in which some of this innovation happens. Antitrust has developed an approach to thinking about barriers to entry and complaints about dominance, where there's one big entrant. Um, and not where there's a thousand small ones, then one of them might become big. And that ecosystem of venture capital is very, very different than some of the traditional um, entry barriers in telecoms and other areas. And um, as consequently, the probability of type 1, type 2 error on intervening um, is very different. So I think competition authorities should be wary about intervening. So let me conclude. Um, the impact within the markets where this is happening of peer-to-peer -peer technology is potentially very large. It's much larger if there is bad regulation in place um, uh, that restricts entry at the moment and protects incumbents. Query how many markets outside hotels and taxes this is going to apply to. Is it going to become ubiquitous in lots of services markets for personal services or is it going to stop in those markets? And that's a question as to whether it gets also replaced by something better. The second question is that regulation is going to get captured by producers. The taxi drivers and hotels at the moment are very good at thinking about um, near threats, me too threats. They can think about what a, a private hire company like Addison Lee in London does, but they're not very good at thinking about Silicon Valley as a threat, but they'll get better at it and they'll capture producers. And they're going to do it on privacy type issues, they're going to do it on social solidarity issues, and they're going to do it on consumer protection um, uh, or producer protection dressed up as consumer protection, which, you know, completely spurious, but it works. And my third point is that antitrust authorities need to shift their balance, I think, fairly firmly in this area and get much better at competition advocacy. They should be trying to think how to make regulators less captured by producers and worry less about big battles between um, uh, one platform and the next iterative platform and let the market fight that out. Thank you very much.